The 2023 NASCAR Hall of Fame nominations have been officially revealed. The Rachel and Ratings have officially come out. And there's a massive debate going on between front stretch interviews and victory lane interviews. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to the video. If you've got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel, let's go ahead and just jump straight in those really, really quickly. We're going to go ahead and start with paint schemes and sponsorship news first. Let's jump into those really, really quickly. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Eric Omrol's 2022 Smithfield and Spiral Hand Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. This paint scheme is really, really good in my opinion. I think Smithfield does a really good job when it comes to their sponsorship and when it comes to the paint schemes. I think SHR has done a great job with them, and I'm looking forward to on the racetrack this weekend here at Martinsville. The next paint scheme we are taking a look at is B.J. McLeod's 2022 Epilepsy Foundation Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. Really cool to see that B.J. McLeod and Lift Fast Motorsports are partnering up with the Epilepsy Foundation. I think that's really, really awesome. And I think his paint scheme looks really, really cool in my opinion. And great to see Epilepsy Foundation is stepping up and sponsoring B.J. McLeod this weekend. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Todd Gillen's 2020 Cross Adjusting Country Adjusting Scheme that we are going to see this weekend here at Martinsville. I think a couple of the races well this season. This paint scheme is all right in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of the color of that number. I'm also not a big fan of the color scheme as much, but it is cool to see another company stepping up and sponsoring Todd Gillen. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Jesse Little's 2020 Scuttle Tide Scheme that we're going to see this weekend in the Truck Series race at Martinsville. I like the colors on this. The green works very, very well on this, and the other colors on the truck look very, very good. Very excited to see this truck tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to seeing the racetrack tomorrow night at Martinsville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Brad Kozlowski's 2022 Solomon Plumbing Scheme that we're going to see next weekend at Bristol Dirt. This paint scheme is really, really awesome in my opinion. The colors don't absolutely work perfectly, but I love a different look of it. I also love that a new company because I don't think Solomon Plumbing has sponsored NASCAR before. So I think that's one thing that's really, really awesome to see is that we're going to see Solomon Plumbing step up and sponsor. I think that's really, really awesome, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Bristol Dirt. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Chandler Smith's 2022 Charge Me scheme that we're going to see, I believe, this weekend at Marzal in a couple of the races as well. This has been leaked, by the way. So, this paint scheme is pretty good, in my opinion. I do like it. It's a much different look for the 18 truck, and it's good to see the new sponsor is coming in and sponsoring Chandler Smith this weekend. Next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ross Chastain's 2022 BA Moose.org scheme that we're going to see, I believe, in later this year at Mart later this season. It's pretty cool to see Moose Fraternity continue to sponsor Ross Chastain. It's also a different look at paint scheme. Pretty cool to see that for sure. Looking forward to seeing a racetrack throughout the 2022 season. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ryan Truex's 2022 USA Pickleball scheme that we're going to see this week at Marsville in his second NASCAR Xfinity Series start. This paint scheme is really, really awesome, in my opinion, and it's really cool to see the USA Pickleball Association is coming in and sponsoring Ryan Truex. That's really sick. Looking forward to seeing the racetrack here this weekend at Martinsville. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Brandon Jones' 2022 Lions and Menards scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. Not much to really say here. It's very similar to other Menards schemes that Brandon Jones has had. It's just basically a different company is sponsoring. There's not much to say here, but it's cool to see that our company is stepping up a sponsor, Brandon Jones. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Denny Hamill's 2020 Sports Clips haircut scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Marsville and a couple other races throughout the year as well. I've always been a big fan of Denny Hamill's Sports Clips haircut schemes. I don't know why. I've just been a really big fan of them. And this one is no exception. I think they did a really awesome job on this paint scheme. The number works very, very well. Never move forward as well. They did a great job on it, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend here at Marsville. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Chris Cervell's 2022 Yahoo scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Marzal in a couple of races as well. That's right, folks. Yahoo is officially joining NASCAR. We're going to talk about Yahoo here in just a little bit. But I love that the scheme is purple. I think they did a really awesome job on it, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack throughout the 2022 season. It's a really awesome looking paint scheme. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s 2022 Kroger Louisiana Hot Sauce Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. I am not a fan of this paint scheme. This does not work very, very well. The colors are mismatched. Louisiana Hot Sauce is not even all across the car. They just did not do a good job on this scheme. JTD's had some good paint scheme this year, but unfortunately this one just is not good in my opinion. I don't think they did a good job in it. I really hope the scheme he does well, but honestly, this paint scheme is not really, really that great. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Ross Chastain and Daniel Suarez's 2020 GoPro schemes that we're seeing this weekend at Marzal. 
That's right, ladies and gentlemen, GoPro is officially joining NASCAR and sponsoring both of them this weekend. These skeins, by the way, look absolutely amazing. The colors work very, very perfectly. Everything on the scheme just works absolutely well. I think these are candidates for the best skeins of the year, in my opinion. They did a really awesome, very solid job, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here this week at MR. So I think that's going to be really, really awesome to see. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Eric Amaral's 2020 Smithfield Y scheme that we're going to see later this year at Dover in early May. This main scheme is pretty good in my opinion. I will say I do, I think one is one of my least favorite of those Smithfield schemes. I do like the red number on the car, don't get me wrong, but there are some things I definitely will work on, but it is cool to see a Smithfield and Wise are coming in and sponsoring the, that weekend. And the final paint scheme as of now we're taking a look at is Kurt Busch's 2020 McDonald's and Money Line scheme that we're seeing this week at Marzel. That's right, McDonald's and Money Line are combining this weekend to sponsor Kurt Busch. This paint scheme is absolutely perfect. You get the good look of the McDonald's on the car, but you also get the Money Line on there. I think they mesh perfectly together and very, very well. And I say this is another scheme that definitely is a candidate for scheme of the year. I think they did a really awesome job, very great job on it, and I'm definitely looking forward to see on the racetrack this weekend here at Marzel. It's going to be nice to see on the track. Looking forward to see it for sure on the track this weekend. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about rural telecommunications of America as it was announced yesterday from Front Row Motorsports that they have joined the Michael Roberts construction team. They are going to sponsor Zane Smith later this year in the truck series, and they have partnered up with Front Row for the 2022 season. It's really awesome awesome that another company is working with Front Row Motorsports. Front Row is a team that has had points struggle for sponsorship, but it is really cool to see the Rural Telecommunications of America is coming in and sponsoring the team. Really excited about that. I'm very looking forward to see them out on the racetrack when they do see the truck at Marzal. Really excited to see that for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Yahoo. As Yahoo has joined a TRD family of sponsors for the 2020 season, they joined Mobile One, I think another company TRD has, and they are going to sponsor not just Christopher Bell, but they're going to sponsor Kyle Busch at Sonoma. They're also going to sponsor Kaylee Bryson for the season with the TRD plan. I think also Buddy Copewood at some point is going to be sponsored by them. They're also going to sponsor Jesse Love, and they'll also sponsor John Hernimacek, I believe, this season as well. Really freaking awesome, by the way, to see that Yahoo is coming in and stepping up to the plate and sponsoring the TRD family. They're a huge, huge company. Even though designing as many people use Yahoo this day, many people still know what Yahoo is. And for them to come into NASCAR and sponsor TRD, which is a multi-year agreement, by the way, I think is really, really awesome. Very, very exciting. And I'm very happy to see Yahoo is coming in. I think this is a huge, huge deal for NASCAR. And having Yahoo come in is really, really exciting, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chris Browning as it was unfortunately was announced today that Chris Browning had unfortunately passed away. Chris Browning had been the president of Rocky and from 1994 to 2003 and had been the president of Darlington Raceway from I believe 2004 to 2013 and was one of the people that installed the lights back into Darlington Raceway among other products around Rockingham and other things. Chris Brown, from what I know, was a really, really good dude from a lot of people. And to hear his passing is very, very sad. My prayers and dulces do go out to his family. And Chris Brown, did a lot of great things for the store. Like I said, my prayers and condolences do go out to his family at this time. Very, very sad day for sure. My prayers and dulces will do go out to his family. Very sad news for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Jeff Gluck poll from Rich. And of course, every single week, Jeff Gluck does a poll after every single race. And he says that he got a 63.1% on the poll, which is, for him, that is his lowest rated poll. This does not really shock me, to be honest with you, because I think a lot of people were going to be very skeptical. To me, I really enjoyed this race, but a lot of people really, really hated on this race at Richmond, and there was also a lot of talk of Brezza Compa potentially coming on to Richmond. It's not a major surprise to me. This got really, really lowly rated. Yes, there wasn't always the best passing world, but I think the race this year at Richmond was the best race we've seen at Richmond in many, many years. So... Overall, I'm glad to see that it did get some okay polling, but it did get a little over 6%, but it's not the greatest polling. That is, uh, right now, the lowest rated poll for 2022. That probably won't be the lowest. There's probably some races coming up. They're probably going to struggle, but that, as of right now, is the lowest rated poll of this year. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about fast. 
as fast revealed that they are officially going to be closing their doors and will not be around any longer. They unfortunately are shutting their company down. For those who don't know, Fast is the company that basically has sponsored Parker Kligerman, and they're known for their $1 NASCAR hoodies. So unfortunately for a lot of people who have those $1 NASCAR hoodies, the company is no longer going to be a thing. And that unfortunately is a big effect because it's unfortunately going to affect a driver named Parker Kligerman, who's been sponsored by Fast with the Henderson Motorsports Organization. Very tough break and very tough situation in that front. And again, it's very, very sad to see that they're no longer around in our sport. It was good to see that they were around as long as they were, but it's unfortunately sad that they no longer are going to be around. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Ryan Blaney. Now, Matt Weaver wrote a very, very good article out here yesterday talking about Ryan Blaney. And Ryan Blaney apparently is interested in having some late model race, doing some more late model races here. And is looking to potentially maybe look at doing a late model return here in the future. Ryan Blaney, of course, is currently tied for the NASCAR Cup Series points lead at the moment. Like I said, he's tied with Chase Elliott for the points lead right now and is still looking for that first win of the 2022 NASCAR Cup Series season. But like I said, he's been very, very fast. I think Ryan Blaney, it'd be really awesome for him to do a late model return. Of course, he is going to be racing in the SRX race here coming up here, I believe, at Sharon Speedway for the season finale. So he will be racing in an SRX race coming up here. But... I think it would be really, really awesome and really, really cool if they got the opportunity to do that. So very, very exciting news for sure that he's interested in doing a late model return. And again, very glad to see that he'll be returning to do some late model race here. I think that's really, really exciting and very awesome news. To be honest with you, I think it's really cool that he's interested in having a late model return. And now we're going to go ahead and on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Jason Stockard. As Jason Stockard is going to be the crew chief for Dale Jr. at Marsville this weekend in the NASCAR Spinning Series. Also, TJ Majors, who is Brandon Brown's spotter currently at the moment, he is going to be the spotter for Dale Jr. at that race as well, meaning that Brandon Brown is going to have another spotter. Like we mentioned multiple times on the channel, this is going to be the return for Dale Jr. to return to the NASCAR Xfinity Series, making his one-off return this weekend at Marshall in the 88 car for Junior Motorsports, of course, is the team that he owns. I think it's really, really awesome to see that Dale Jr. is coming back. Jason Soccer was a crew chief for Miguel Pluto this about a week or two ago at Circuit of the Americas. So, very exciting news for sure, and glad to see that Jason Soccer is going to be the crew chief for Dale Jr. Really exciting news for sure. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about F1's T upcoming TV contract. Now, it was reported by Adam Stern, I believe, on Monday afternoon that he says that Liberty Media's president and CEO, Greg McFay, tells CNBC's David Faber that F1 has a lot of media companies interested in bidding for U.S. media rights and that a return to ESPN next year is not assured. This is a major, major surprise. ESPN has been basically had the holder of the F1 race since I believe 2017 or 2018. It's been about four or five years since basically ESPN has taken over for those rights. And they've seen a lot of big return investment, including when it comes to their TV ratings. However, they're looking at the future. There are some companies that are looking at getting in. I know there's just been some talk to NBC behind the scenes is looking to get in there. There's other media companies like Amazon, I believe, that are also and Netflix that are interested in that as well. I really hope the ESPN does get to keep it. Now, one big thing that a lot of people are going to be talking about here is will there be will there be commercials? One of the big things that Formula One coverage at this moment right now is there are no commercials during the races. So that's one thing a lot of fans do not want to see is they do not want to see commercials. I hope it does not happen, and that's one thing I'm really hoping for long term, but that's one thing we're going to be watching is where we go from this point forward. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Ronnie Bassett Jr. As Ronnie Bassett Jr. is going to be driving to 77 for Bassett Racing this weekend at Marsville. Of course, Bassett Racing is still looking to make their first Xfinity Series start of the year. They have failed to qualify in all the races so far, and they'll be looking to make their first start of the year. They barely missed last weekend at, at Richmond, and they're still looking to make their first start. Ronnie Bassett Jr. has made quite a few NASCAR Xfinity Series starts and also, I believe, does have a Canaan East or Canaan West or Arc East or Arc West victory. So the guy knows how to get it done. Really excited to see for sure Ronnie Bass again. Of course, they're still going to need to qualify into the event. I hope they're able to make it in. And I think it'd be really excited if they're able to qualify into the event, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Justin Carroll. As Justin Carroll is going to drive the 94 Carroll Racing this weekend at Marsville. I do believe that this will be Carroll Racing's debut and this will be Justin Carroll's NASCAR Camping World Truck Series debut. 
Justin Carroll has made a few starts in the ARCA series and also in ARCA East and ARCA West in the past. And I don't think he's won a race yet, but like I said, he's had some pretty decent, some good runs. I think he's had a couple top tens. So really exciting news for sure that Justin Carroll is going to be making his debut in the NASCAR Truck Series. It's really exciting news, and we'll see him if he can make it into the show. Because again, there's qualifying going to be happening for the Truck Series. Three trucks are going to go home, so hopefully he can be able to have enough speed to make it into the show on Thursday. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Johnny Sauter. As Johnny Sauter is going to drive the 13 for Thor Sport Racing this weekend at Marsville with Junior Joyner being the crew chief. This will be his first start of, I think, six or seven starts that he's going to be making with this team. And also, this will be his second start of the 2022 season. Remember, Johnny Sauter was supposed to make around 13 or 14 starts with Glory to God Racing. But because of how bad he was running in that event, he probably decided that, you know what, I'm just going to draw myself out of this concert with Glory to God Racing. And I'm no longer going to race for this team. So this will be Johnny Sutter's first competitive opportunity of the 2022 season. Overall, I think Johnny Sutter is going to probably have a good shot to contend for the victory. I know he's not really been that great the last couple of years, but he is in Thor Sport Racing, and they've looked pretty competent this year. So I hope Johnny Sutter can do really, really good, and glad to see that he is back in a 13 truck for Thor Sport Racing. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we are talking about Kyle Weathering. As Kyle Weatherman is once again going to drive the 34 for Jesse Wuji Motorsports this weekend at Marsville. This will be a second star with the Jesse Wuji Motorsports team here and will be, I believe, a sixth star or seventh star of the 2022 season. Kyle Weatherman is a very, very talented driver and got Jesse Wuji Motorsports a top 30 finish this past weekend at Richard. So he knows how to get it done and he's a very, very talented driver. Don't get me wrong, I wish he had a better opportunity in this, but still, it's good to see that he's getting another opportunity with an organization, and again, very, very happy to see that he at least has another opportunity. Two races here, he's a very good driver, a very gifted and talented driver, and he'll be driving a 34 for the team this weekend. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Natalie Decker. As Natalie Decker is going to be driving a 28 for RSS Racing this weekend at Marsville. I do believe this will be Natalie Decker's second attempt of racing this year. She did attempt at Daytona earlier this year for Xfinity, but unfortunately failed to qualify for Ram Brothers Racing Organization. It's unclear if Ram Brothers is backing her or not this weekend, but she'll be in this car this weekend. I'm going to be real, Natalie Decker is probably <clears throat> going to have a chance of failing to qualify. I think this, actually, she won't be able to, finish, able to fail to qualify because she's 30 right now in owner's points at the moment. So she should be safe from not, basically be safe from failing to qualify. That being said, though, is she, because she's pretty much in the show, she needs to step it up, and she needs to have a good run this weekend, in my opinion. Because, again, she hasn't really done really, really that great. I hope she can do a good job, but that's one thing <clears throat> she needs to do, is she needs to improve her craft here in the NASCAR city and uh, throughout her NASCAR career. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Graham Rahal and the rise of F1 stars and in, in, of impact of IndyCar. So we've talked about this with Kevin Harvick and talked about this with other drivers about the impact of young American drivers and Alexander Rossi Respondents as well, by the way. We've talked about this on the channel about this. And Graham Rahal says, he says, it just needs a serious, serious rethink. And hopefully Roger sees it, Roger Penske, because F1 is not going to be shot. The one thing F1's got at a lot of more of than NASCAR and ACAR is money, and they'll spend it to help out development. Now, one of the biggest things we talked about last week on the channel earlier this week is that basically right now there are a lot of younger drivers, at least in the karting scene, who are very interested in going over to Formula One. A lot of young American kids who are very interested in going over to Formula One instead of racing in NASCAR or IndyCar. And that's one thing is because Formula One has had a massive rise here in the United States. And what you kids see that's appealing is whatever is appealing they're going to want to go out there and try to compete in that. So that's one thing that F the IndyCar and NASCAR need to do is, one, they need to set their promotion game up when it comes to these races. But number two, they need to try to basically gank these kids saying, you're not really going to have an opportunity to go to Formula 1. It's just not very possible. And that's a bad thing to say. I know I sound harsh when I say that. But it's very unlikely that a young kid is going to go out there and is going to be in Formula 1. It's such a tight-knit group right there. And it's really, really unfortunate. Again, it would be really, really unfortunate for sure if kids can't really race in Formula 1. But at the same time, it's not very possible at the moment right now that these young kids especially can go over to Formula 1 and race right now since it's such a tight-knit group. So Graham Rahal definitely has a point, and he's got a great point in my opinion. 
And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Ford F-150 Lightning. As it was revealed yesterday that the Ford F-150 Lightning is going to be the pace truck for Martinsville this weekend. I do believe this will be the first time the Ford F-150 Lightning is going to be the pace truck in NASCAR history. So that's really, really cool and really awesome to see if they're going to be pacing the whole weekend. This also is really awesome that Ford continues out of development when it comes to that and very exciting to see that the Ford F-150 is coming in and being the pace truck. I think that's really, really awesome. Glad to see the Ford F-150 is going to be the pace truck here at Martinsville. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Daniel Suarez and Martin Truex Jr. Now, the reason we're talking about Daniel Suarez and Martin Truex Jr. is because both of them were cars were sent back to the R&D Center after the NASCAR Cup Series race. And if you remember last week or a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Brad Keselowski got a major, major penalty because his car was sent back to the R&D Center. Well, as expected, as per usual, there are no penalties being handed out to Martin Truex Jr., or Daniel Suarez, the only penalties are a couple of of issues for two of the call cars. This should not surprise anybody, and really the big reason why, the big thing is with R&Ds, they normally just do R&D every single week. They didn't do R&D last week after Coda, but they did R&D after this week in Richmond. And the reason that Keselowski has such a big penalty, by the way, is because he mess, may be messing apart. We don't entirely know about that. Those penalties are going to be announced most likely tomorrow. But what exactly Keselowski does, that's going to be a big thing to watch over the weekend. That being said, though, I do entirely believe that I'm not surprised that they didn't get any penalties. I know some people are like, well, of course, they're basically trying to penalize Ford and trying to punish Ford. But that's not really the case whatsoever. You're not supposed to mess with those parts. So it's good to see that they didn't get in trouble for it. Good news for sure overall. And like I said, very, very exciting to see. Not exciting, but good to see there's no penalties being handed out to those teams. Really exciting news for sure, to be honest with you. Go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Drive to Survive. As it was reported yesterday by Adam Stern, the F1 plans to bring back Drive to Survive for a fifth season in 2023. As CEO Stefano Damanchiali dismissed the idea that the Netflix docu series might not return, and a second source confirmed that filming for next season has begun. Drive to Survive has been around for four seasons, like I mentioned, and looking to have a fifth season. Now, the one thing I'm going to say about Drive to Survive right here is they need to stop with the dramatization. Last season's ratings were terrible. They only got a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes compared to, I believe, in Season 3, where I think they got like 60%. So they've been rapid, rapidly dropping. If I'm Netflix, stop with the dramatization and put more effort into it. But I will say that for the first years they had it, they've done a really good job. And Dry to Five, I will say, has not very successful for Formula 1's growth. So I do hope they keep doing it, but... If they do keep doing it, it looks like they're going to. They need to stop with the over-dramatization of that, and that's one thing that they overall do need to stop stop doing here long-term, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Bristol Dirt. As currently, as I'm currently filming this at the moment, there is a next-gen test going on currently at Bristol Dirt with Stuart Friesen driving the car. And there's a video that was released today with him driving the car up at the track. From what I can see from this video, it looks like he's a lot higher than last year, meaning that he's trying to get a second groove working, which if they have a second groove working, that is a major good step in the right direction because one of the biggest issues last year with the Bristol Dirt Race was there was really no way he could get a second groove working really, really good without getting too high or getting into the outside wall. Looks like they're trying to get that second groove working, which is the major step in the right direction. It also looks like there's not as much dust buildup. Of course, with the test right now, it's not sunny, but with it being a night race, this year there won't be any major dust problems here on Easter Sunday so I think that's a major positive and look to me the National Guard sounds really really awesome on the dirt just like it's all it has all year long and again I'm very excited for next week at Bristol Dirt where we talk about a lot of stuff in regards to driver lines for Bristol here in just a little bit for some really awesome drivers getting involved in that but I think it's really really awesome that their test is next car Bristol I think it's important that they do that and it's suck this car by the way sounds really really awesome and really, really sick, in my opinion. I think did a really good, that, that is really, really awesome sounding car, for sure. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we are talking about William Byron. As William Byron is going to drive a 7 for Spire Motorsports this weekend at Mars. This will be William Byron's first truck series start in 2022, and only his second start in the truck series since he raced full-time in 2016 for Kyle Busch Motorsports. And we'll have HenderCars.com on that truck. 
William Brown, of course, in 2016, while not winning the championship, I think he won six or seven races that year, had had probably the most successful rookie season in NASCAR Camping World Truck Series history. William Byron definitely has a shot to win this race, in my opinion, for a couple reasons. One, William Byron is a very talented driver, and the Cup Series drivers have done really, really good. But also, Alex Bowman, a couple weeks ago when he ran a circuit in Americas, had one of the fastest trucks in that race and nearly won the race there. So I think if this truck has a really good shot of winning, I do have a theory he'll be getting that seven truck and at Bristol next week. But I think William Byron's got a really good shot. He's also very, very good at Mars. Now, of course, tomorrow night he's going to have to be Kyle Busch to win that race. But I think if there's anybody that's capable of being Kyle Busch at Marzel, I think it's definitely going to be William Byron. So I think he's got a really good chance of winning. Of course, he's going to have to go against Kyle Busch to win that race. But I think he's got a very outside, but a very good chance of winning that race. I think he's got a good shot of getting it done. And I think there's a very good possibility that he's going to get it done here at Marzel this weekend. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Haley Deegan. As Haley Deegan is going to be racing in the Truck Series race at Marnsville despite the issues that have been going on off the track. I'm not going to get into too much detail of what's been going on with Haley Deegan, but been following the situation with Haley Deegan, y'all probably know that she's been dealing with some really, really bad stuff when it comes to people doing really, really messed up things to her, basically sending threats to her, among other things that have been happening to her. We're Regardless of your opinion on Haley Deegan, how you really feel about her, whether it's her talent or not, this is one thing that needs to be said. Nobody should have to go through the stuff that this girl has had to go through. Her and Chase should not be going through what they're going through right now. And it's really unfortunate that there's people, sick and cruel people in this world, that feel like it is okay to do what they are doing. I don't understand why people feel like it's okay to do that, and it's really, really messed up. It's good, though, they're trying to move on, they move past that. It sucks they weren't able to race in the Freedom 500, but I understand what the situation they were going through. I really can't blame them for stepping out of that. Again, I'm hoping that they get the situation cleared up, especially with the individual. I'm not going to get into names. I know who the individual is. I'm not going to get into names here, but I hope they get the situation cleared up here really, really soon. And there's no major problems on term, but we can see them back on the track, which it looks like they're going to. It looks like they're moving past that, which I think is a major step in the right direction for them, in my opinion. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Harrison Burton. As Harrison Burton is going to drive a 17 for DJR Racing in the Truck Series next weekend at Bristol Dirt. I believe this will be Harrison Burton's first Truck Series start since jumping up to the Xfinity Series in 2020. And well, I guess it will be his first Truck Series start of 2022. Harrison Burton, of course, currently drives the 21 for Wood Brothers Racing, is looking to get experience here in the Truck Series before the Cup Series race takes place at Bristol Dirt since he's never raced here before in NASCAR. Really good opportunity for Harrison Byrne, by the way, and I really think that he's got a really good shot of winning this race. The 17 trucks look really, really competent. Ryan Priest has been really, really fast in his truck this year. We've seen other drivers get into that truck and do very well, and I think that he will be very, very competitive in this race. Now, he's got a really also Hunt Brothers Pizza Corps sponsor, which is a really, really nice looking truck, by the way, but I think Harrison Byrne has a very strong chance to win this race. I think, I know it doesn't have much dirt experience, but it seemed like last year, especially, the dirt ringers weren't as good. And Cup guy like Martin Trickson, who really didn't have a ton of dirt experience, he came in here and stomped the field. If you got talent, you're going to be able to get it done. And the Cup guys, especially, I think, are going to be able to step it up to the plate and get in this trucks and do very well this week. And so, really excited to see Harris Burton next week and getting behind a wheel. And I think he's got a really good and great shot of winning that race, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Joey Logano. As it was just announced that Joey Logano is officially going to be driving the 54 for DJR Racing this next weekend at Bristol Dirt and making his first truck series start since I believe 2015 when he last won at Marsville for Brad Keselowski Racing. He also will have Planet Fitness on his truck as well. This is absolutely great to see that a NASCAR Cup Series champion like Joey Logano, who, by the way, won the inaugural race at Bristol for the Cup Series, it is really awesome that he is getting behind a wheel in this series and getting back behind racing in the tr truck series. And it's going to be a really great experience for Joey Logano to get behind a wheel of one of these trucks. You think about the caliber of Joey Logano and what he's been able to do, and it's really cool that he's getting behind a wheel of a truck. And I think like Harrison Burr, like I mentioned a minute ago, I think he has got a very good and realistic shot of winning this race. I think that cup experience is really going to come into play 
for Joey Logano. And it's really cool seeing another Cup guy is going in. Of course, you've got two or three guys that are confirmed for the Cup Series now that are joining Joey Logano, Harrison Byrne. There's some other people, probably like other Cup guys, that are going to get involved to get some experience in this Truck Series race, like maybe Kyle Larson, perhaps. But honestly, I think it's just really awesome to see that he's getting back behind the wheel and racing in the trucks for the first time in five or six years. Like I said, I realistically think that Joey Logano has a very strong and a very good possibility chance of winning. You think of the caliber of what he's been able to do, one of the best drivers in NASCAR currently at the moment. Still, of course, looking for that first regular season win in the Cup Series right now, but I think he's got a really awesome shot to win the dirt truck race at Bristol Dirt. A lot of competition is going to be in that race, but I think he's got a very good and awesome chance of getting the victory done here this weekend at Bristol Dirt. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Dale Jr. and Carl Edwards. Now, we've in the past talked about Carl Edwards. Maybe he's talked about a potential return in NASCAR. Well, Dale Jr. sent a tweet out basically kind of theorizing about maybe a potential return of Carl Edwards. Dale Jr. says about Carl Edwards, and he says that in his vision, Carl Edwards will have an awesome comeback. I think Dale Jr., I know this sounds like we're kind of theorizing a lot of things, but is Dale Jr. theorizing a NASCAR return for Carl Lovers? And he's saying, is he saying that Carl Lovers is coming back? We've talked about this on the channel that basically Junior Motors, we're talking about this last a couple days ago, as a matter of fact, that Junior Motorsports currently is interested in joining the NASCAR Cups. They're still very interested in that, and they're waiting for the opportunity. And Carl Lovers has in the past had seek interest and has had interest in racing in the next gen car. So is this a theory that's going around I think is going to happen? No, I actually do not think Carl Edwards is, at least as of right now, going to come back. Here's where I think I'm going to theorize something. I think Carl Edwards actually, though, could in all seriousness join, and not join, but actually go into the on the Dale Jr. download. The Dale Jr. download is, of course, a really, really good podcast that Dale Jr. does. And I think it would be really awesome because Dale Jr. gets personalized not just for NASCAR, but other walks, life, and other types of racing as well. I think it'd be really awesome if he got Carl Edwards to come on and join that. I think it'd be very, very fun to have Carl Edwards on. I think he'd bring a lot of great insight and a lot of great information. And like I said, I really hope that we do get to see Carl Edwards into this and, and come on the Dale Jr. download. I don't think Carl Edwards is going to come back to NASCAR, at least as of 2022 or even 2023. But I think maybe he comes back for one-off return. I think that'd be really, really cool. But... I think Dale Jr. is on point here. I think that Carl Edwards, in his vision, would probably be a really successful driver. I think it'd be really, really awesome, and I do hope that at some point we do see Carl Edwards maybe make a return. But again, I don't see him coming back here in the near future, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the Kyle Busch tape controversy. Now, if you watched the NASCAR Cup Series race at Richmond this past weekend, Kyle Busch was penalized around 40 or 50 laps ago with tape being on the grill. Now, there was radio communication that came out later and said that he had that tape on the grill for 200 laps, and NASCAR just finally decided to penalize him for the major penalty. Earlier yesterday, Brad Moran was on Sirius and NASCAR radio, and he says Kyle Busch's team put tape on the car around lap 128. The tower was notified by official on pit road around lap 234. From there, officials had to go through video to find when it was put on and make sure the team did it and wasn't debris on the car. This response is really, really frustrating for a couple reasons. You took you guys over 100 laps to penalize him, and it took an official over 100 laps to basically decide, hey, this is definitely a time to make a penalty call. Let's wait until the last 50 laps of the race to make a penalty call. Here's the thing, though. This is the right call. I don't think that a lot of you are mad that NASCAR made the right call because, again, you're and with these new cars, you're not supposed to put tape on the grill. The frustrating thing right now is basically it took them this long to figure it out. It should not take NASCAR this long. If there is a true penalty call, it should not take NASCAR 200 laps to penalize somebody. Now, the whole team could have just avoided it if they just decided, hey, let's not put tape on the grill. We probably shouldn't have done that. We should have not put it there. And they accidentally put it on the wrong area. But at the same token, at the same time, NASCAR, if there's a penalty that needs to be called, they need to call way sooner than they did. And the fact that it took them that long to call it is absolutely absurd and absolutely ridiculous. NASCAR made a really, really bad judgment call right there. In my opinion, NASCAR definitely needs to be called out 
for all that stuff. Again, I'm not blaming NASCAR for making the call. I'm blaming them for waiting too long on the call. If there is a call that needs to be made, it needs to be called instantly. They will call debris. They will literally call people for speeding on pit road within a lap or two. They will call people for pitting outside the box very, very quickly. And they'll call people a lot for running over equipment. They'll call it out very, very fast. If you put tape on a grill, that should be an instant penalty. It should not take 200 laps because that's going to frustrate the driver and that's going to frustrate the crew chief. Again, the call was right, but they waited way too long for the call. That's where the frustration lies from the fans, and I feel like Kyle Busch has every right to be frustrated with that, and I think the team really, really screwed up on the front, but at the same token, at the same time, like I mentioned here, it should not have taken that long for them to make a penalty call. Very, very frustrating for fans, and very frustrating for the driver. I don't blame Kyle Busch if he's upset about that. Again, it was the right call, but they waited way too long on the call, and they should have made it sooner. So in my opinion, I think, again, they made the right call. Waited too soon, though, to make the call, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to go ahead and talk to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Fox Sports pre-race shows. As Dana McFade had made a really good article out, of course, Dana McFade, I believe, currently works at Front Stretch. He wrote out a very good article about Fox Sports' pre-race shows and how much they really need to be fixed and went in depth. I 1,000% agree with this article. Fox Sports this year especially has been going down a deep rabbit hole. This is something that's not new, though. It's been an issue that's been going really since last year and the last couple of years. But really ever since iRacing stuff happened, they've been going down more of this comedy route. And this year, I will say there are some positives to Fox coverage, but the biggest negative is the pre-race shows. Don't even get me started with the pre-race shows. I thought Daytona 500 pre-race show was good. And then he gets to Las Vegas, and then you have this Chase Selling and Kyle Larson skit that was just horrendous. It made no sense when literally Bob Pock reported on the pre-race show on race day on FS1 that literally they resolved their issues, and it seemed like they're moving on. Then they get out to Phoenix, and you have the Mean Girl skit, which I don't understand what the point of that was. It wasn't the worst thing I've seen, but you have the Mean Girl skit. Also in Vegas, you have the Bob Pockers party, I believe, and you also have this really bad fortune teller skit, and the grib walk's also as cringy as hell, as usual. Then you get out to, I believe, Coda, where you have them do this little, like, breakthrough, trying to sing Austin by Blake Shelton, basically mimic the song, and then, then they basically have this really cringy grib walk with The Undertaker, where Michael Waltrip is intimidated by The Undertaker, and then finally, this past week, this is the issue. They had a freaking skit of a watermelon seed that was on the side of Ross Chastain's mouth when he's eating the watermelon. They had a skit on, I think, Clef Howard, whatever his name is, was basically doing, they did a skit with him being the actor, and then they just had this terrible song of them trying to do a parody of Rich Girl with Richmond. When is Fox going to wake up? This is not entertaining. There is a point where Fox needs to be a lot more serious, and people are getting frustrated. I have complained a lot on social media. A ton of YouTubers have complained about this. Not even just YouTubers. When you have media members who have media credentials complaining about your pre-race shows, that should tell you something. The one thing Fox has done right, though, is rotation of the boot. That's one thing Fox has gotten right this year. This one major thing, a positive I will say Fox has done. They've had a great rotation of people in the booth, and that's, they've done an awesome job right there. Also, Mike Joy has generally done really, really good. I just don't think he really gives as much of a crap as he used to. But I will say Mike Joy is still one of the best broadcasters. In fact, I think it's very a very hot take. I would argue he's probably the greatest commentator I've ever had in NASCAR. That's a major, major hot take. But I think it's between him and Ken Squire. You can make a major, major debate. That being said, the pre-race shows. What needs to be fixed? The biggest thing is Fox needs to take the pre-race shows a lot more serious. Look at F1's presentation when it comes to the coverage. F1 takes their coverage a hell a lot more serious than NASCAR does. You need to be serious with what you're putting out there. Don't get me wrong. You can have a little bit of funny. You don't need to absolutely be per picture perfect serious, but you need to at least have some seriousness. Look at the presentation like I said for Formula 1. I watched a pre-race for Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, and they had an amazing sit-down with Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz at the Ferrari plant, and they did an amazing job on that. And it's fun to listen to, and you get a lot of insight. That's one thing that Fox Pre-Race has been missing for years. Back in the day, they did a great job on it, but now they don't do as good. And that's one thing that absolutely needs to change and absolutely needs to be fixed 
is they need to take the pre-race a lot more seriously because people are getting frustrated with it. A lot of people, I'll tell you, is a big reason why I think Fox's TV ratings have gone down because people don't take NASCAR seriously. Formula One is a lot more serious, and I think NASCAR needs, and NASCAR, and really Fox in general, needs to fix their pre-race shows immediately. It's one thing that needs to be fixed. If they don't fix it, and I really, because at this point, if they don't fix it, I don't want them coming back. They need to fix it now. It needs to mean overall, it needs to be changed with these TV networks, and Fox is included in that. There needs to be a change immediately, in my opinion. There has to be a major, major change, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're talking about Mike Joy. Now, Mike Joy, there's been a really major debate going on about front stretch interviews versus victory lane interviews. It's been really going on here, and I was part of this debate as well. Mike Joy put out a very interesting tweet last night that I don't entirely agree with for those points. I will say that I do agree with. He says that Victory Lane got to be a joke. People trape a towel over the driver's coverage of his sponsors, put hats on head, his head, changed his mid-interviews, sat crap on the roof on the car, and even put up a fence so he couldn't swat competing brands off his roof. Sad fight for TV airtime. This is something I will say. I am someone that is for victory in interviews. I understand where Mike Joy is coming from, but I entirely disagree with Mike Joy. Now, don't get me wrong. Front stretch interviews do have a benefit of basically you do get to see the driver celebrate outside of the car. When they jump out of the car, you wouldn't get to see Noah Gregson's amazing celebrations. You wouldn't get to see Denny Hamlin's crazy celebrations or Chase Briscoe climbing up to the fence. The front stretch interviews really have taken up a hit really in 2020 when the COVID was around. But the biggest reason I think a lot of people do not like front stretch interviews is because of the situation last year with the Let's Go Brandon situation. If we've had the, this situation where we had this car or the whole Brandon Brown in victory lane instead of out on the front stretch, the situation most likely never happens. That's one of the biggest reasons why a ton of people do not like the front stretch interviews. And also to me, I think victory lane interviews just magically work a lot better in my opinion. Again, it's not. It's also a nostalgia purpose. I'm kind of like one of those nostalgia people that victory interviews work. I do understand where Mike Joy is coming from. He's got good points here, and it's not like he's he's bringing a lot of insight here. And a lot of times, I do 100% agree with him. But really, for the first time ever, I have to kind of disagree with Mike Joy here. I like victory interviews a lot better, and we do not need another situation where very something controversial. Someone might get hurt. A driver might get things thrown at them, and they may get seriously hurt. And then, is there a pending? going to change right there. That's one thing I will say about victory in interviews is I'm more of a fan of victory in interviews than front stretch interviews. Don't get me wrong seeing the genuine them get out of the car, but it should be about the whole team too. And when you're in victory lane as well, you get to see the whole team celebrate. That's the thing that needs to change. And I hope in the future, and at least I will say this, if you want to make a compromise zone, it's something that could be a really good compromise. Why not bring victory lane out to the front of the track? Have like a victory sound like they do at Martinsville. If you want to make that happen, have it on the front stretch, but celebrate there. I would actually be a really good compromise right now to do that on Marzel every time, and I think that will work very, very well. So that's maybe one thing that they could do in regards to that. But I do disagree kind of with Mike here. I understand where Mike Joy is coming from. I totally get it. But another thing that could fix this problem is, you know, give more post-race coverage. You guys don't give enough post-race coverage. You give 90 minutes of pre-race coverage, and these are the both networks, not just Fox, but NBC as well. But you need to get more pre-race coverage, post-race coverage as well, because then you could probably fit in all this stuff into victory lane. So that's one thing that I would say needs to be fixed there. But overall, I will say I do disagree with Mike Joy. I respectfully disagree with Mike Joy, but he does bring up some good points in my opinion. But again, I understand where Mike Joy is coming from. At the same time, I don't in some ways also agree with him. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the first of two major stories of today's episode as we're talking about the Richmond TV ratings from this past weekend. And trust me, they're really, really good. Reported yesterday by Adam Stern that Fox earned a 2.31 rate, three rating and 3.958 million viewers for Sunday's NASCAR's Cup Series race at Richmond. That is up double digits from both the seven points paying races, which was Bristol and Richmond last season. And also, it was reported later in that article, in that report, that it were up 16 years on a year-by-year basis from there, but it's also a misleading because the Daytona 500 did, got rained out last year compared to this year where it did not get rained out. It was still a little bit down from 2019. I will tell you this. 
This is huge for a lot of reasons. And the biggest reason this is huge is this is going to help with the TV contracts going forward. But why this is also huge is because we're still kind of maintaining that 4 million gap. We've been in that kind of 3.9 to 4 million range most of this year. We've been up and down throughout the year. Daytona was up from last year. Auto Club went down just a little bit. Then Auto Las Vegas went up a little bit. Then Atlanta went up this year. And this is the third or fourth race this year where it's went up. Because historically, when it comes to the TV ratings, gradually the numbers are going to go down over time. But what's been happening, it's been kind of like a roller coaster this year when it comes to the TV ratings. And that is a major positive, is that it's not like it's going down. And we said this year, we're probably going to see an increase in ratings throughout the year, and it's been a good thing. Now, what can we do here as NASCAR fans to kind of help keep these ratings up? One, we got to keep promoting these races, Fox. Keep doing that, and keep promoting the races, and promote the good races. Because I think the race has been great this year, and I think if people see that, they're going to continue coming in. Because again, I don't think we've had a bad race this year, but you got to get the ratings, you got to keep the ratings up. And of course, Fox taking their coverage a lot more seriously, and both the networks are taking their coverage very, very seriously. Promotion and marketing is another big thing. If you market these races out and try to get that 18 to 49 demographic, because what's the most important thing right now? It's not the older people, even though NASCAR's fans are much older. It's that younger demographic that you're trying to promote to. So that's a thing that need, does need to happen. But I will say, though, this year, ratings are definitely in a much better shape. And like I said, the biggest reason we're talking about the ratings as much as we are is because how this year goes is going to be really important to the TV contracts that are coming up here very, very soon. And we're getting really, really close to that. And we're probably going to start hearing a lot more about that this year. And really, it's going to be heating up next year. And a really big thing is if this year's ratings are up drastically like they've been this year, we're probably going to see NASCAR get in better shape when it comes to the TV deal. But I think this is a major win-win for NASCAR. Good rating, good ratings week, in my opinion. And very happy to see the ratings for this weekend are up. Really exciting news for sure. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we are talking about the nominations for the 2023 NASCAR Hall of Fame. There are some new people that are, of course, in this year's NASCAR Hall of Fame that are eligible for that. If this includes Matt Kenseth, Tim Brewer, of course, another driver that's involved is, Hirsch, is AJ Foyt, and then, of course, you have Sam Ard, who is eligible this season. Now, the people that are on this list this year for the NASCAR of Fame are Neil Bonnet, Tim Brewer, Jeff Burton, Carl Edwards, Harry Gant, Harry Hyde, Matt Kenseth, Larry Phillips, Ricky Rudd, and Kirk Schumeldeen for the modern-day ballot. For the Pioneer ballot, Sam Ard, AJ Foyt, Banjo Matthews, Herschel McGriff, and Ralph Mooney are all eligible for the Pioneer ballot. Now, for next year's class, there's two people that will be eligible for that. Jimmy Johnson and Chack. We'll get in that for a second. Next year's class for 2024, Jimmy Johnson and Chack and us will become eligible for the 2024 class. So whoever gets in this year, if you don't get in, you're probably going to be waiting here for the next couple years if you're on the modern-day ballot. Let's go through each of the people on this list. Neil Bonnet has won many, many races in the Cup Series. I think he's won 22 or 23. I'm not entirely sure. But he's won quite a few races in the NASCAR Cup Series, including winning at Rocky and multiple times and other major events, including also winning the Coca-Cola 600. Tim Brewer, a legendary crew chief, I believe crew chief, I think, at points for Daryl Walter, I believe, and also crew chief for Rusty Wallace as well at, at some points as well, if I'm not mistaken. Jeff Byrne, a 21-time NASCAR Cup Series winner and currently works on NASCAR and NBC. Carl Edwards, a 28-time NASCAR Cup Series winner and winner of the Southern 500 and the Coca-Cola 600 in 2015. Harry Gant, known as Mr. September, won four straight races back in 1991 and the oldest winner in NASCAR Cup Series history. Harry Hyde, legendary crew chief, crew chief for many, many drivers back in the 1980s, and they made a movie, the Days of Thunder, based off of that. Matt Kenseth, the only champion on this list, in the NASCAR Cup Series, winner of around 38 or 39 races, and has won the Daytona 500, and has also won, I believe, other races, including the Coke 600, Coca 600 and the Southern 500 as well. Larry Phillips, legendary driver in the Wheel of Modified Tour, won many, many races there. Ricky Rudd, known as one of the most Ironman drivers out there, ran many races throughout there, and won and had a streak of like 16 or 17 years where he won a race. And then Kirk Schelmerdine, a race car driver, also the crew chief, for Dale Earnhardt Sr. And in the Pioneer Ballot, of course, you have Sam Ard, one of the best legends, one of the people who really helped bring the Xfinity Series up. AJ Foy, one of the greatest drivers of all time. Banjo Matthews, of course, I think an owner and also a driver. Herschel McGriff, a legend of our sport. And then, of course, Ralph Moody, a legendary owner as well. Other people on this list, I'm going to tell you who I think should get in in 2023. 
Let's start off with the first one. This one to me is a no-brainer. Matt Kenseth absolutely needs to be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. He's the only champion on this list. I know there's talk maybe they're going to try to say 2015 would hurt him. He needs to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He is the only driver on this list as a champion. There's no doubt in my mind that he needs to be in there. The second driver on this list, it's very tough to say there's a lot of good people on this list. I kind of, on a personal basis, want to see Carl Edwards get in. Just because, of course, I, Carl Edwards is one of my favorite drivers. I'd be very happy to see. I think a lot of drivers on this list deserve but I want to see Carl Edwards be the second modern-day ballot. The third person in the Pioneer ballot for me, this one to me is a no-brainer, A.J. Foyt. A.J. Foyt is arguably one of the greatest motorsports drivers in racing history. You need to have him as one of your people that is eligible. I hope he's one of the people that does get in. He's the other person that needs to get in. Don't get me wrong. Everybody on this list deserves to be in here. And I wish more people were eligible for it. But that's one thing about the chain is it's going to make you more intrigued. Again, with them having only two from the modern day ballot and one from the Pioneer, I think they should have increased it this year just because we didn't have a Hall of Fame last year. I would have thought maybe we could have had three from the modern day ballot and then two from the Pioneer ballot. I think that would have worked out much more perfectly. But I will say that they do a good job when it comes to that. I do like they change the rules, though. So I'm very excited about that. But I will say absolutely Matt Kenseth needs to be an absolute no-brainer, needs to be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. He needs to be a no-brainer right there. He's the one driver, one person on this list that I will, will be disappointed in if he's not inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. So, anyway, that's today's long NASCAR and motorsports video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel for notifications on Speed Notify when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on page as well. Let's go below over that and comment your thoughts on today's video. Who do you think should get into the 2023 NASCAR Hall of Fame? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts on all the other stories we discussed here today on the channel? Let me know in the comments below. Tomorrow on my channel, we're going to be having the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series race view from the Marsville Speedway. And throughout the rest of the week, we're going to have some news videos among other products because this weekend is Marsville. We've got some race views that are coming out as well that you will see on the channel. So anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video. <coughs> and I'll see you guys next time for some more great, awesome NASCAR and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.